O oh muse, sing in me. And through me, tell the story of that man skilled in all the ways of contending. No, that's not it. When the April, with his surest suit, the draught of March hath pierced to the root. No, that's not it. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. But the mirror cracked from side to side, and I was much further away than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. Ah yes, the stories are here, the stories are you. And your fear and your hope is as old as the language of smoke, the language of blood, the language of languishing love. The gods are all here because the gods are in us. Some people claim that we are in a post-literary age, that even people who want to have no time for literature. The changes in UK publishing since the 1990s, turning it from an editorial to a market-led uh, sector, combined with the rapid development of new ways of creating and reading literature, thanks to the digital revolution, have destabilised our understanding of the role of literature. But other, other changes have had a hand in this too. My colleague Rebecca Braun observes, in the past, European elites have traditionally looked to authors of political, philosophical and literary works for guidance on how to live as a way of processing what is happening in one's contemporary surroundings and in order to imagine future worlds. Following the late 20th and early 21st century erosion of belief in the social value of literature degrees, the drastic decline in uptake for language learning and the crisis of confidence in the humanities more broadly across the Anglophone world and mainland Europe, there is an ever stronger sense that the case for literature as a quality authored artifact that is not prim primarily justified through either economic or technological developments is difficult to make. Now, there's a long history of scholarship that explores what we mean by the term literature, but I'm not going to do that today. My opening words, which sampled some of the literary voices that helped shape Western culture over the last two to three thousand years, Homer, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Tennyson, Stevie Smith, Kate Tempest, will have been unmistakably literary to your ears. Elevated language, powerful images and sounds, and you may have recognized some of the quotations, and if not, the words might still have sounded familiar to you as they represent words and worlds that have been passed down influencing writers of successive generations, weaving themselves into the cultural fabric of our societies and informing the very scope of our imaginations. So, taking the literary as a given for now, what I do want to talk about are the shifts in how literature is created, experienced and valued. Twitter, Twitter poetry, graphic novels, Hypertext fiction, computer-generated novels, self-published novels, e-readers, artist books, slam poetry. What is their creative potential for the future and how does this potential align with other trends? <clears throat> to make clear the opportunities and challenges of the current moment, I'm going to present three scenarios that sketch three plausible futures of literature in the UK in the year 2050. In writing the scenarios, I've drawn on historical trends analysis and data from co-design workshops that I've been running with a number of literary professionals across the UK. So the perception that digital technologies offer a proliferation of creative opportunities and increased access to the modes of creative production and consumption for more diverse groups of people was clearly communicated by participants in a focus group that I conducted in March. 2017. So the participants, some of whom you can see here, 
um, were literary professionals and academics, all kinds of literary professionals, from writers to publishers to agents to editors. So these participants, they posited three major areas of change in the UK's literary sector over the, over the last 50 years. First, changes attributed to technological innovation in relation to reading and writing practices, all linked to a sense of increased access to cultural material and more diverse creative voices, which is great. Second, shifts in the values attached to forms of literary production, including an increased interest in international and or translated works and increased access to live literature in the form of spoken word poetry or slam poetry circuits. Third, a shift in the makeup of creative communities. So participants perceived an increase in diverse community building opportunities for creative people facilitated by the internet. These elective communities tend to be based on a sense of shared identity, a political interest, or a technical skill set, instead of necessarily language or geographical location. In general, then, the perceived shifts outlined above relate to a sense of opening up, diversification, and increased interactivity in relation to the production and the consumption of literature. Significantly, however, this sense of optimism about the current state of literature amongst those working with it daily coexists with some worrying trends that I alluded to at the beginning of my talk. So in 2015, 4% of editorial staff in UK publishing were found to be from black and ethnic minority backgrounds, whereas 28.8% of the working population in London are from such backgrounds. A 2016 investigation by the BBC revealed that almost 8,000 jobs in UK libraries have disappeared over the last six years. It's about a quarter of the total, of the overall total. Over the same period, some 15,500 volunteers have been brought in to replace those workers, and um, 343 libraries have closed. A 2016 report by the new Local Government Network and Arts Council England revealed that local authority investment in arts and culture has declined by 17%, which is worth £236 million pounds since 2010. Then we have this 2015 report by the Warwick Commission on the Future of Cultural Value. They found that the English education system was failing to provide or encourage a broad cultural and creative education for all school children and reiterate, reiterated the value of such an education. Further, as Lyle Skeynes has, has noted, digital literacies are not yet ubiquitous. They're not everywhere. This is because technical and monetary bar barriers to entry still remain. Software is expensive if you want to do creative writing um, with these kind of new software platforms. It's expensive, and you often require quite difficult um, technical skill sets. And the social media that those writers were so, so keen about, the social media used by them and other literary professionals, are the same ones that we all use, Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, YouTube, and they do facilitate collaborative opportunities and creative expression. Yet, such user-generated content is simultaneously tracked, analysed and capitalised upon by those same platforms through targeted advertising. So, in the scenarios that follow, I take into consideration the optimism communicated through my ethnographic work, as well as the other structural shifts shaping the broader context. Come with me into the future. The year is 2050. Scenario one. Over the last 20 or so years, the number of independent bookshops in the UK has shrunk. The major chains, Waterstones, Foils, Blackwells, have all gone out of business. Library funding continues to decrease, and libraries have dedicated more of their space to computers and 3D printers. With fewer books on fewer shelves across the UK, publishers are worried about how readers will discover new books and unknown authors. Writers fear that increased market segmentation will consolidate a model of niche publishing that prioritises formulaic, guaranteed bestsellers 
like Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah. over, challenging, uh, over challenging original works. Amazon's digital platforms for literature and self-publishing, they remain strong, a very strong market force. But major publishing houses and small independent publishers in the UK have developed their own digital platforms, many of which are free to use. These platforms prioritise works in translation, new authors from underserved communities, and audio vers versions of oral literature from many cultures around the globe. And at the same time, YouTube poetry has reinvigorated public interest in live literature in the form of storytelling evenings, slam poetry competitions, and open mic nights. Live literature circuits are thriving in both urban and suburban and rural areas in the UK, and traditionally print authors are finding new sources of income from the live performances of their work. Scenario two. Still the year 2050, just a different world. The internet has become an increasingly commoditized realm. Bloggers and bloggers invest creative energy into their texts and videos on behalf of the corporations they represent or who sponsor them. Open source platforms like Twine have proliferated and more creative people are doing their work via these as opposed to those platforms or technologies they now deem to be too corporate uh, in the pocket of the advertisers or just downright unaffordable. At the same time, there has been a growth in book maker groups. They're using 3D technology and traditional print methods to create books that themselves are works of art. While digital literacy is increasingly foregrounded in schools curricula, there is less of an emphasis within the school system on reading books as sources of knowledge and enjoyment and creative writing, it's not taught or practiced in schools anymore. And some people think that's why the book maker communities are springing up everywhere. Scenario three. It's the year 2050. Now when Britain voted to leave the European Union in 2016, the gross value added of the creative industries was 81.4 billion pounds making 5.2% of the UK economy, the whole economy. Jobs in the creative industries were growing rapidly at that time in 2016, with their whole GVA growing by 8.9%, which was twice as fast as the economy as a whole. In creative sectors like publishing, as well as music, performing and visual arts, non-European migrants made up only 3.9 and 3.1% of the workforce, respectively. The departure of many Europeans from the UK's creative industries after Brexit had a significant negative impact on securing creative industry workers. Not all of the jobs available in the UK could be filled by domestic employees. They weren't qualified. Tightened migration regulations and restricted visa routes for non-EEA workers, this is by 2050, only reduced the number of non-British workers in the UK's creative sector. And by now, there was a national focus in the UK school curricula, including how culture and literature are taught. And this had combined with the dominance of Anglophone media to severely reduce cultural exchange and cultural literacy amongst school leavers. The cessation of language learning in schools was long coming, but it happened. And the disappearance of translator development programmes, these resulted from the sweeping public sector cuts of 2037. All of this, they've added to it an increasingly narrow understanding of language and culture and their value in future creative sector workers, as well as amongst the general populace. Now, the objective of scenario writing is to impact on the present. In short, possible futures are already here. So we better start shaping the literary future that we want. Thank you. <laughs>